Radio Algeria International presents International Policy Code, a weekly program hosted by Les Fermazari. In addition to the global economic crisis, the Middle East is experiencing a political earthquake. In the last three decades, Turkey's position has been based on the use of diplomacy in an efficient way to help resolve disputes and conflicts. Our guest in our program is Professor Udo Steinbeck. He was the head of the Near East Department of the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. He is now honorary professor at the University of Hamburg in Germany. Professor Steinbeck, welcome to our program. Welcome. Over the years, Turkey has actively participated in various peacekeeping operations carried out by the UN, NATO and EU. However, Turkey during uh, Kemalism period considered the Middle East as a threatening environment from which it has to be protected. Any comment about that, Professor? Uh, Turkey has made uh, tremendous efforts over the last uh, 10 years to um, regain some of the territory it lost after uh, the demise of the Ottoman Empire. So being for many decades part of the EU uh, process of of NATO, uh, Turkey has tried to to get to terms with Arab countries. So it's only recently that uh, uh, Turks, to an increasing extent, consider the Arab world sort of a threat to Turkish security. So we have to take into consideration both aspects, the aspect of cooperation and trying to mend fences with the Arab world, as well at the same time the threat, the perception as a threat. For a long time, Ankara stayed inactive on regional issues. Turkey became a representative of the Western world powers and therefore was increasingly alienated from the region. Well, that's correct. Mm -hmm. But that has been deliberately done so uh, by the founder of modern Turkey, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. He thought that recently, that, that really Turkey should stay out of uh, all the conflicts uh, in the Middle East, Arab, Israeli, intra-Arab, uh, in order to, to find a sort of stability by itself, against the backdrop of the historical experience that for many centuries in Turkey, in the framework of the Ottoman Empire, was involved in that sort of conflict uh, to the extent that eventually the Ottoman Empire broke down. So they didn't want to, uh, to repeat the experience, and that's why they decided to stay out. And it's only um, after, nine, after, the, after the 1980s that uh, Turkey started a process of rapprochement uh, with the Arab and uh, Islamic world. Well, immediately following the collapse of the Soviet Union, Turkey took the initiative of establishing in uh, 1992 the Black Sea Economic Cooperation Organization, headquartered in uh, Istanbul, inviting all Black Sea countries, including Armenia, with whom Turkey had no diplomatic relations. Well, I think the example of the Black Sea Cooperation Zone is, as you rightly pointed out, there is still the the problem with Armenia, and uh, in fact, if we draw a balance sheet of the uh, Black uh, Sea Cooperation Council, it's, uh, mm, it's, it's quite zero. It doesn't mean uh, very much. Mm-hmm. So uh, Turkey started with great illusions in the 1990s, mm, extending its politics into Central Asia, into the Caucasus, into the Black Sea region. But it basically, it came to the conclusion that uh, there are limits for Turkey's influence when it comes to the Black Sea region, and uh, that one should focus on economic cooperation, and uh, that is, I think, what the focus is right now of the Turks, economic cooperation with the countries, with the Turkic countries Mm -hmm. in Central Asia, with Azerbaijan in the Caucasus, and some of the of the other of other places surrounding the Black Sea region, yes. especially, of course, with Russia. How about its relations with its neighbors? Well, uh, historically, Turkey didn't get along with Greece, well, Russia well, during I mean, the Cold uh, War we, era. We have to see that the, the Balkans, as well as ma- the uh, part of the Black Sea region, they belonged to the Ottoman Empire. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, on one hand, uh, it, there was a very strong relationship. On the other hand, when uh, the Ottoman Empire came to an end, there were very many nasty things that happened. Uh, for example, 
the expulsions of the Greeks from the Black Sea region and from Anatolia. And uh, so that sort of thing, for, for decades, soured relationship between Turkey and uh, the, many of the countries which formerly had been part of the Ottoman Empire, including, of course, Greece. Professor Steinbach, how do you describe Turkey with AKP administration? I think we couldn't mm. do it in one sentence. Sentences is dedicated to the era between 2003 and 2011. Um, these, this decade was a decade of tremendous progress um, administered by the uh, AKP administration. But then since uh, 2011, that has changed and the AKP, especially the present president, Mr. Erdogan, Turkey, being quite a well-working democracy for a long time now, and we shall see how this is working out concerning the relationship with the EU. Professor, what is the role of Turkey in the whole region? Is its role limited to the inter-religious dialogue? Turkey has tried to play a role in the, in the inter-religious dialogue, to play the Islamic cards. Uh, Turkey has developed very strong relations with the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood. So this is one aspect. But for the time being, I think, the Turkish role, from a political point of view, from an economic point of view, from a cultural point of view, the Turkish role in the Middle East, related to the neighboring countries, the Islamic neighboring countries, is a very, very limited one and very contradictory, especially if we see what's happening in Turkish-Egyptian relationship, I mentioned the relationship with the Muslim Brotherhood on one hand, but that has soured relationship with the Sisi regime. Relationship between Turkey and uh, Egypt is very bad right now. And then, of course, we have the Syrian problem. Uh, Turkey wants the uh, Assad regime to vanish from the sea, but um, it hasn't done very much in this respect. Now we have the Islamic State, uh, Daesh, uh, operating on on uh, Syrian soil, on Iraqi soil, and we see some sort of mm, relationship, some sort of alliance between Turkey and these terrorist organizations. That's why I think that Turkey's relationship with the surrounding area, with the surrounding states, is a very, very contradictive. Uh, would Turkey bring Iran back into international politics? It depends on mm, which way, the, especially the Obama administration for the, for the next two years will move. If uh, Obama uh, does not really make efforts, serious efforts to solve the Syrian crisis, then I do not think that Turkey will come back into the fold of international politics, that Turkey will move away in one way or another from EU interests and from, from uh, American interests, and that will lead to an increasing isolation of Turkey within the international scene. What about Turkey's role when it takes over the 2015 term of the G20 presidency? What changes can it bring? I really would like to see what, what Turkey is going to, to do. For the time being, of course, as I mentioned already, we have a president in Ankara who constantly uh, interferes with the judiciary, who in itself and by itself will limit Turkey's role. Do you think the EU has to question its relations with Turkey and the dilemma of Turkey's membership process? Well, I've, my assessment is that uh, we, Turkey and the EU is, uh, as by 1980, when the military interfered in Turkey, it becomes ever increasingly m more distant to the Copenhagen criteria, which are the basis of um, Turkey-EU rapprochement. That's why I think that, of course, on one hand, we are sitting in the same boat when it comes to the Middle East, when it comes to the threat stemming from the Islamic State. So we need each other, but I don't think that there is any common ground for the, time, for the time being and for the foreseeable future when it comes to further EU-Turkey rapprochement. Do you see Turkey moving in the direction of the breaks, Brazil, Russia, India and China? Well, economically, yes. Economically, yes, Turkey um, is a very ambitious uh, economy, and uh, so I think it's, uh, they have the ambition to become um, the tenth largest uh, economy in the world in five or ten years from now. And uh, in addition, we shall, uh, this will imply the question how Turkey is developing politically. Uh, so is it going the way Brazil is, has been moving over the last decade, or is it more the Russian style or the uh, 
the Chinese style to have a strong government, strong authoritarian government, that would mean that, again, that Turkey on one hand is moving fast economically, but uh, that the distance between the EU and Western democracies and Turkey is going to increase, and that Turkey may, may have the ambition to increasingly come closer to countries and uh, regimes such as Russia and China. So what was behind President Vladimir Putin's recent visit to Turkey? They are sitting in the same boat to some extent. Economically, yes, mm-hmm. uh, Russia is the biggest uh, trading partner of Turkey, especially when it comes to, to oil and gas. Mm-hmm. And now, politically, they both uh, are in a, in a mood of confrontation between the West and Russia, the West and mm, Turkey. So uh, the two people, the two guys are sitting together, even they are looking very much alike, Mr. Putin and Mr. Erdogan. And uh, this is something, um, rapprochement, which is based on, on, I wouldn't say common interest, but on having the same enemy, which um, has been called the United States, uh, the EU, and um, Putin is afraid of uh, the EU's imperialist attitude, and Mr. Erdogan is uh, afraid of um, the EU uh, being a culturally and religiously uh, dominating power, deviating Turkey from its Islamic tradition. Today, Turkey enjoys a non-visa regime with over 55 countries around the world. Is it a threat or beneficial to the country? Well, it depends on how you see it. it. For the country, it may be beneficial for the country herself, for that places Turkey uh, in the focus of interests of 55 states, and that brings them, the Turks, into very close contact economically and politically. This is one side of the curve, of the coin. The other side of the coin is that, of course, entering Turkey freely means to go on, or could mean to go on from Turkey to EU countries, and this is being perceived in the EU increasingly as a, as a threat. And that's why many politicians in the EU and in Germany, they argue that as long as people are so freely moving into Turkey and out of Turkey vis-à-vis the European community, as long as this is the case, one has to, to build up uh, barriers between uh, Turkey and the EU. And it turns out that the visa regime of Turkey um, might become b- b- might be uh, perceived in the EU from a negative point of view. Well, Turkey is sheltering nearly 2 million Syrian refugees, including some 190,000 from the Syrian border town of Kobani or Ain al-Arab. How did the European react to such humanitarian assistance? Again, I think we have to see it from two um, points of view. Mm -hmm. The one point of view is that there are 1 million and a half refugees from Syria in Turkey. This is, from a humanitarian point of view, this is a tremendous effort of Turkey. On the other hand, uh, many people now in uh, coming from Syria into Turkey, they create social and political problems. And then, of course, we have the, the Kurdish issue. Still, the Kurdish issue in Turkey has not been solved. Now we have Turk- and Kurds coming from Kobani, coming from the Syrian parts of uh, Turkish of, of Kurdish territory, and um, they would expect that Turkey, in one way or another, assists them against the Islamic State. But nothing of that sort happened. And this is my assessment. This could sour again a relationship between uh, the Turkish government and the Kurds within the country. And this could sooner or later lead to an end of the peace process between the Turkish state and the Kurds, which has started some years ago. Well, Professor, when AKP came to power, Turkey was 26th among world economies. Now it ranks 16th in the world, as well as being the sixth major economy in Europe. Turkey appears to be doing very well in economy. Yes, and this is uh, really a, a tremendous, uh, tremendous uh, success, which um, Mr. Erdogan can, may, may claim, and he does so. Once more, we have to see Turk, the way Turkey has developed between 2003 and 2011 from an economic point of view as well as from a political point of view. We have to see it in a very, very positive and very constructive way. And uh, certainly, uh, Turkey has become a very proud country. 
On one mm-hmm. hand, we mm-hmm. appreciate, we have to appreciate mm-hmm. the tremendous economic effort. On the other hand, the political role, which is based on this tremendous economic effort, uh, is a very dubious one. Last question, what is at stake for Turkey in 2015? What are the challenges for Turkey? The, Turkey, the challenges, as Mr. Erdogan himself sees it, is whether it, he will succeed in having a new constitution or not. Uh, by the 19th of January 2015, for the first time as a president, and in his function as a president, he will chair a, 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 a sit in, in the, the Ministry Council. So this is an indication that he wants to have as much power as possible. But uh, in order to institutionalize this, he has to have a new constitution. So there will be elections in 2015, and he will make ev- every effort that uh, not only he will win, the AKP will win the election, but uh, that they will get a two-third majority in order to be in, the, in, a, to be in a position, one-sidedly mm, shape a new uh, constitution. And I think that is his main goal for 2015, to have a new constitution and the presidential system. Udo Steinbach, professor at the University of Hamburg in Germany. Thanks for being with us. Thank you very much.